Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to Bangkok Podcast. I'm Pandit Bhikkhu, and with me today is my two special guests, my two examples of the expat community, expat way of thinking. Uh, with me today is Greg Jordanson. Hello, welcome. I'm and, glad to be here. And Tony Joe. Hello. Welcome. Nice to have you on my show. Thank you. <laughs> I heard so it's a huge success. I'm so nervous. <laughs> So I wanted to ask these two fellows, as examples of the expat community, uh, a few of the things of their expectations about monks and monks' behavior in Thailand. Now, by way of explanation, if you don't know, I am an ordained Buddhist monk, and I've been here for 15 years. And it never ceases to amuse me the different kinds of expectations that people have on us poor monks. <laughs> Actually, we're just very simple, ordinary people, just like anybody else. But because of the robes and because of the shaved head, there's a whole raft of expectations that people have of us. But the funny thing is that the expectations vary from person to person. Now, I wanted to start off then. There was, back 20, 30 years ago, when the Beatles were coming over to India, and it was a new thing back then, this, this blossoming of Eastern spirituality, of Zen Buddhism, of Indian gurus, and this was a new thing in the world at that time. But now things have kind of calmed down a lot. There's a lot less mystique around Eastern religions than there used to be. So I wanted to ask you, what do you think is uh, Eastern religion? What does it mean to you? For me, the first thing I think of is is monks. When you say Eastern, you, for me, I generally think Far Eastern, from Thailand to the right. Thailand, Vietnam, Japan, which is largely Buddhist or Shinto. What do you think would be the difference between Eastern religion and Western religion? Is there a difference in the mindset? What kind of values or ideas would you associate with Eastern religion? I would associate Eastern religion with a more peaceful history. And I know that's not a blanket statement and there's many, many holes. But you remember that movie, A Fish Called Wanda, when that idiot guy was meditating and he's like, Someone said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm meditating. It's what the Buddhist monks used to do before they went into battle. It's a Buddhist meditation technique. It focuses your aggression. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But, I mean, everyone knows about the Crusades, but I just can't, you, you don't hear about too many armies of monks, you know, raping and pillaging and mm. streaming across the land. So when I think of Eastern religion, I think of a more reserved, a more philosophical, a more peaceful mm. history. There have been, like, warrior monks and armies of monks and Sri Lankan monks with machine guns and... But you're right, it's more associated with uh, peacefulness. And yet the message of Christianity is all about peace and forgiveness, right? Yeah, it gets muddled sometimes. The difference that I think, for me, between Western and Eastern religion is that Western religion, to me, focuses on one being. Wherein, whereas, to me, Eastern religion focuses on more yourself mm -hmm. and the thoughts that you have in your head. Yeah. Yeah, I think Western religion is very much we're we're just puppets. Right. But Do Eastern what the guy says. Right. Eastern religion is like take your fate into your own hands. Mm. This is what Osho said to uh, one of his interviewees. He said, "Now you've got a great mustache. I really like your mustache." He said, "But if you're going to go halfway, why not go the whole way and have a beard?" He said, "A man without a mustache and a beard is just as bad as a woman with one." <laughs> <laughs> But curiously, one of the things that Osho was talking about in that interview was his use of humor. And he was a very humorous guy, and some of the jokes he told were pretty risque. I mean, they were, they were quite harsh and sexual in their nature. And one of the criticisms that he was given was, why are you bringing in all this foolish humor? Now, this was also uh, a question with us on this show that one of your listeners wrote in and said you should be more respectful to the religious people. And yet, knowing me, you know, I'm a fairly humorous guy. I like to joke around and... Yeah. So, is joking around, is that an acceptable part of a, a religious persona? What do you think? I think, for me, personally, I mean, I <laughs> have no problem with it, but if you look at Asian culture, for example, in Japan, if in the company is facing a tough situation, and the boss comes in and needs to address the workers. If the boss comes in and is joking around, the workers would interpret that as the boss not taking the situation seriously. Whereas in the West, we use joking to alleviate tension. Hey, we're all getting fired tomorrow, but no problem, we'll go to the beach. You know, so you're always joking around. 
Whereas in Japan, they would they would look at the boss. Uh, he, he would undermine his leadership ability or perception by joking around. So my thinking is that for Eastern religion, if they see or hear a monk joking around, it kind of undermines his holiness or his, his spirituality or his teaching um, to the uh, Thai people. Hmm. That's what my take is on on that. Even with Western religions, you're, I think it's a bit of a shock too. Like I was raised Christian, but I remember, you know, when, whenever you meet like the cool priest, it's, it's a, it's a <laughs> thing, right? Like, oh, I have to go see the priest, Father J- Johnson. Oh, oh, no, no, he's cool. Right. He's funny, man. Right. He doesn't even, he wears like jeans and stuff. Right. Like you have to educate people, even with Western religion about this guy who doesn't fit into the cookie cutter mold of what, a traditional priest would be hmm. like, oh, I got to go and talk to the priest. Oh, that sounds boring. No, no, he's really funny, man. He's cool. He's, he drives a sports car. You know, has a tattoo. Yeah, yeah. Like that stuff is like you have to explain that to someone. That's not something that's just sort of automatically assumed. You know, so you, I think the default position of when you when people think of religious figures in authority is sort of somewhat reserved, hmm. stoic. It's funny in Thailand, the a lot of the monks actually are big jokers. Really. Um, and they have their audience in stitches. There was a very famous monk here called Prat Payom, and he's extremely funny. He just says a few words. Actually, it's not even joking around. He just says something ordinary, and he'll have the whole audience in uproar. Uh, but the funny thing is, the monk isn't supposed to be laughing. The monk can't be clowning around, but he can still say something funny to have the audience laughing out loud and being in stitches. Do you think yeah. there could ever be a monk stand-up comedian? <laughs> like, if you went to, a, like, had put on a, a, a comedy show mm. as a monk? And well, there's a very famous monk called Ajahn Brahm, and he is often accused or praised, depending on your viewpoint, of doing exactly this. Uh, he will have the audience laughing out very loud. And some people criticize him for doing that, and other people tend to really love him. So he has a huge following, but he has a, also a huge battery of critics. In my mind, if you're a humorous person, uh, as long as you've got a real message, as long as you're not doing it just for the laughs, then sure, I think it's a good and helpful tool. According to psychology, when you're doing a talk, people can't concentrate for more than five minutes. So every five minutes, you have to do something that will engage with the audience. That is either you have an interaction, make them raise their hands, uh, or stand up, or do an exercise, or you tell a joke and make them laugh, or you shock them and have a silence period. So in that sense, laughter is just one of the many tools to keep people's attention. And when you're giving long, boring sermons, you need techniques to keep people's attention. Not when I was in church. There's no, <laughs> maybe that study was done when I, after I reached about 15 years old, because holy moly, was that ever boring. I should say Thai humor is extremely gentle. Coming from England, humor... He's always very harsh. Oh, very British humor is deadly. It, it's really quite nasty when you, you view it. Just watch The Office mm. <laughs> with Ricky Gervais. Uh, but Thai humor is always very nice. It's always appreciative and it's always supportive. It's not it's not cutting and critical like mm. a lot of Western humor. It's not sarcastic. Mm. They don't really have sarcasm in the same sense. Here's a joke for you. A man goes to the doctor and he says, Doctor, I just have so much trouble with my greed. I'm just so greedy. And the doctor says, oh, that's all right, we have pills for that now. And the man said, give me lots of them. (laughs) (laughs) So that's good, right? That's a joke about Buddhism, about greed, about wanting. It's gently poking fun at something that's inside all of us, or you could could say that it's it's sort of making fun of someone who's a victim of greed. Uh, I... I, mean, I think there's a line you can come down on either side of that, really. Like anything, like religion itself, you can interpret humor in many different ways. Yeah. Um, I I don't think it's bad at all. I think humor is uh, is is a, is a is a mind expanding drug essentially, and I think it helps you understand concepts that, like you said, would normally be boring and staid. And like, who wants to sit there and listen to a dude drone on for an hour? Okay, so I wanted to uh, ask you then, maybe Greg while you're on. What do you think about a monk riding a bicycle? Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, Forgetting the robes getting caught. I was just going to say, you, you, like, you ever put a sock up on your leg, but you need to put like a sock up to your waist? 
Um, I think it would, I think it would be a bit odd, but not wrong. And the only reason I think it would be odd was because I've never seen it before. Right. But you've uh, seen it in the West, right? A, a local vicar, certainly yeah. in England, would be expected to ride on a bicycle. Probably on their way to the pub. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't think it was bad. I mean, it's just, it's just, a, maybe he's in a hurry. Maybe he's got to go and help someone. I don't know. It's. Tony? Yeah, I mean, I would agree with Greg. I don't see anything wrong with it. It would look a little bit strange because we've never seen it here, but other than that, I, I wouldn't think twice about it. But I can see where, where this conflicting idea comes from because I can see Jing's point of view as well because part of the reason that Thais respect monks so much and part of the reason that Westerners think that monks are so holy as well is because you have taken that extra step to forego the desire, the need, the greed that, that we all encounter. Oh, I want the new iPhone. Oh, I want to have this. Oh, I got to borrow money to buy this. So you've forgone that and that's noble. And that's why that's part of the respect that, that people pay you because you've taken that extra step and decided to cut that part out of your life. That part that causes greed and jealousy. Um, so then, but then you crash up against the fact that you need a computer and it's got to be a fast computer because it's got to hook up to the internet and you got to have a badass bike because traffic in Bangkok is so bad and you got to, you know, like how do the, how do you reconcile those two ideas, mm -hmm. giving up these modern tools, but also using them to remain relevant. Mm -hmm. So crash sound effects, boom, lightning. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I think that's where a lot of the conflict comes from. Uh, let's pick another one. Um, would you expect a monk who would go home and see his family to pull on a pair of jeans and t-shirt? No, I would say you shouldn't do that. <laughs> I don't think, because your uniform, your robes are your identity, part of your identity. Uh -huh. So is the shaved head, but you've stolen that from us. Well, <laughs> once you show me your trademark on it, then I'll start paying you for it, <laughs> for the, for the right. Believe me, I wish I didn't have to. But I think that it's, it's sort of like a requirement of belonging to that club, mm -hmm. the club of being a monk. You need okay. to wear the robes. Uh, the, re the reason I asked this was a few years ago I had an interview with a Harry Krishna who mm -hmm. also has a shaved head and wears the same kind of robes. And this particular guy said that he would never walk into a shop and buy a newspaper. That would just be unacceptable for an ordained person. But when he goes home to visit his parents, he would put on jeans and a t-shirt uh, to make them feel more comfortable. I was interested in this because I have the exact opposite view. I would have no compunction about going into a shop for a newspaper. However, I would never change out of the ropes. So I thought it was interesting, these different views and expectations that people have uh, of ordained people. But why, why would you never change out of your ropes? I don't. I guess that's my own expectation also of myself. There was a, a lot of the Buddhist tradition was around sewing the robes in a certain shape and a certain pattern. It's actually just a square sheet, but they're supposed to be hand sewn and dyed. And we have a lot of rules about how many robes you can have and what they're to be used for. So then just to ditch that and put on other clothes would, in my mind, not be acceptable. But I did see one Malaysian monk, and he's a Theravada monk, same kind as the Thai, and he received an award in Malaysia, and he went to the award ceremony dinner and when he went up to receive his award, he was dressed in a suit, in a suit and tie, because he said that was appropriate to the situation that he was in. The Buddhist community around the world condemned him uh, almost universally and said he should not have changed out of his robes. So I was interested in these kind of uh, expectations that people have. Here's another one that I'm going to fire over to Tony here. Do you think monks uh, should be allowed to smoke? I mean, for me, I'm a firm believer in doing whatever you like to do. So it's hard for me to wrap my brain around belonging to any kind of organization that places all these rules and restrictions on you. So my thinking is if you want to smoke, smoke. Just don't do it in the same room as me. Because you know what? I think, I think smoking monks freaks out phalangs a lot. Because it's kind of right. a common thing that you hear all the time. Yes. Phalang come here on holiday and see this monk walking out here with a cigarette. They're like, oh my God. 
Well, go on Flickr and type in Pantip Monk. You'll see a million photos of people. Look at, look at the monks at Pantip. Like that's, right. like that, that's that one more thing that Where just. Where else do we get our computers from? Well, you know, that's, that's the thing is monks, <laughs> people don't think your monks you are supposed to have computers. You can't get them in the corner shop. So <laughs> you have to you can get them. everything at 7-Eleven. There's been a number of movements to try and ban monks from Pantip. And I'm very glad to say that universally the monks have not accepted any such movement. What's the monk's version of, oh, no, you didn't? <laughs> <laughs> and there's even signs hung outside Pantip at one time that, you know, we do not welcome monks here, but we, we just ignored them. Because where else do you get your computer from? Fortune. Uh, <laughs> Fortune or, I actually go to a very small center for my computer equipment. Yeah. As I say, most monks now, uh, especially if you come into the city, you are expected to engage in some kind of education. That means Naptam and Pali. Dhamma exams and Pali exams, then you're expected to either go through university, which requires, it even has courses on computers, or you're expected to work in the temple. And again, everything in the temple is done through computers. All the accounting, all the, the building, the ordering, everything is all done through computers. So if you can't use what everybody in the common society is using, if you've never been to school and learned how to add up, you're basically just sitting there totally reliant on people to run around you and look after you. But you know, a lot of this is all a matter of perspective too. I mean, it's, I, I imagine that if you went back 800 years and had all the monks who were dyeing their robes by hand would look at a monk 200 years ago dyeing their, or 100 years ago dyeing their robes with a machine as completely inappropriate. Yes, probably. You know, so, I mean, it's just a shifting viewpoint of what is correct and what's not. And then now, a monk who was washing their clothes with a machine would probably look a hundred years ahead to today and see a monk, you know, sewing their robe with a sewing machine is, you know, also inappropriate. I've noticed Thai monks, when they go and live abroad, they suddenly get very versatile. Yeah. And so often they will start riding bicycles or driving cars uh, or going to the supermarket and buying things. They tend to be a lot less rigid than one would expect. And I think that's a movement with the times. But when you look at the original rules, very few people actually know what it said in the original rules. For instance, we're actually told not to ride on any form of transport unless you're sick, which means I can't take a bus, a motorcycle, a train, or anything. So if it was really keeping the rules, really, in the modern day, <laughs> it would just be impossible. Cough quietly in the back seat. <laughs> <laughs> There's another rule about we're not supposed to take a shower more than once every two weeks in the rainy season. Now, we don't follow that rule. You know, we, we keep clean. Uh, you're not supposed to use perfumes, but we all use deodorant, for example. Now, the smoking thing, interestingly, was the Buddha specifically allowed smoking. The Buddha. Yes, did. It's in the Vinaya, in the monk's world, it specifically allows smoking. So there's actually no rule against smoking. That's not to say that anybody thinks it's a good idea. Except um, the cigarette companies. Yes. <laughs> and smoking in those days was really herbal remedies that you would smoke. It wasn't tobacco, of course. However, it is, it is actually allowed in the Vinaya. But see, this is my whole point with why I reject religion is that it's because it's so malleable and so pliable and you can twist it and turn it and make it surely you would reject it more if it was totally unmalleable unbending unadaptable that would be more of a reason to reject oh man my stumped him yeah it's not that hard really <laughs> but, but no i you know here's a, here's an example i have a friend in canada who is a very strong christian i have a friend in thailand who is a very strong christian my friend in Canada thinks that gays should not be allowed to marriage, think that gay, being gay is a sin. Doesn't, she's not like hostile or outwardly vindictive against gay people, but she thinks it's a sin against God. My Christian friend here thinks it's fine. You're, you're, you are who you were born to be, and you should accept that and love everyone. But they're both Christian. They both claim to belong to the same club, but they have completely different views. And I think that's, that right there is one huge weakness for me. That just, that just the whole house of cards falls apart. Because how can you belong to the same club and have different viewpoints? It's this is very black and white, I think. Well, really. why not? You might belong to a golf same golf club, but you support the Democrats or the Republicans. Yeah, but a golf club isn't an organization set up to a political organization. I mean, you, you, you know, what I mean, like it's it's if you if you want to join our club, these are the rules. End of story. Okay. You know, like I, I go to work every day. My boss says this is this is your job. This is when you have to come into the office. And if I don't come into the office, I can't belong to that club. You know, it's black and white. That's my viewpoint, anyway. Mm -hmm. If that makes any sense. 
Uh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> you are a funny guy. <laughs> yeah, um, for my own point, I'm quite glad that Buddhism is very versatile, and it was really all about something that is not about the mind. It's not about your views. It's not about your beliefs. It's about a direct uh, experience that you can gain through meditation, that you start to see in what direction enlightenment lies. And this is when the mind is empty, not when the mind is full of views and opinions. So in Buddhist terms, all views and opinions are basically the same. All views and opinions are an obstacle to this pristine, aware, equipoised presence of mind that we're aiming at in meditation. All views and opinions are going to take you from that. So we don't actually really cling to beliefs in the way that many other groups do. And that also means that you may come in with a whole raft of beliefs of your own, but when you're meditating, you give up all that and come back to something that's more immediate. The prime example is, do you believe in God? I'm going to ask Tony this. you believe in God? I remember your answer to me last time was... No. Okay. That makes it easy as an interviewer. <laughs> <laughs> Worst interview ever. One word answers. <laughs> okay. Hell no. <laughs> I had... Uh, there's a Calvin and Hobbes cartoon I saw once, and Hobbes... The, the pet tiger says to Calvin, do you believe in God? And he strokes his chin, and the next picture he looks up in the air, and then the next picture he looks down and says, well, somebody's out to get me. <laughs> 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 uh, Greg, you believe in God? No, but it depends how you define God. Right. I believe in uh, power, but you might as well just call it the force <laughs> if the you force. want to. You know, the force binds us, it surrounds us, it penetrates all living things. Um, so you'd be interested then to know, Karen Armstrong wrote this very good book, The History of God, and she outlines that throughout history, from the last 5,000 years, practically any possible viewpoint you can have of God has been held by a religious monotheistic group in the past. Whether you think God is completely immaterial and just a, a form of nature and not a being, it's been done before whether you think God is the force, it's been done before. But then the next question is, you say, I'm going to come back to Tony and say, what makes you think your belief is right? Do you believe your beliefs? Of course. But as a rational human being, you can't possibly believe that your beliefs are going to be right. I believe they're right for me. So they're not empirically correct, they're just, just correct in your own head. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> I don't believe in the, the Christian version of God. I don't believe that in some spirit hanging out in the sky. I believe that a lot of that, that belief comes from human beings' lack of knowledge about why we're here. It's trying to explain situations that we don't have answers to. So we try to seek out, you know, why, where we come from, what's our meaning of life. Um, so my personal belief is that I don't believe any kind of force is up floating around there. But that wasn't the question. The question is, what makes you think your beliefs are right? I believe they're right for me, and they suit my direction in life. So what you're saying is, I like my beliefs, and I'm going to keep them. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right, but as a rational sense. human being, you can't possibly really believe that it's your beliefs that are right. Your beliefs about God, heaven and hell, uh, rebirth, the meaning of life, etc. I believe that other being, people will have a different belief. Mm -hmm. But that, but asking Tony like a question like that is, you might as well debate the legitimacy of a mother of a of a mother grim fairy tale because, for some, I'm assuming Tony is thinks like I do. The whole heaven and hell thing is has the same legitimacy to me as as a children's fable. It doesn't exist. But again, that isn't the point. The point is that you believe that your beliefs are correct, mm. right? And as a rational human being, really, you can't believe that your beliefs are correct and everybody else's beliefs are therefore wrong. No, I, ne I never said everyone else is wrong. Mm -hmm. I said that what I believe, I, I don't believe my beliefs are either incorrect or, or correct, is that they are beneficial to me in my life at this point. Because my beliefs can change with new information. Right. 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 So then was the old belief incorrect? Or was it just obsolete? So I believe it just, if you take a belief as just a, a, a useful tool in the present moment for handling the world around you, that would be a very Buddhist way of, uh, of relating to beliefs. I guess I'm a Buddhist. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the club. Do I have to shave my head? Here's your diploma. Did I get my robe? Uh, 
but you see, most people will take their beliefs and they think, oh, this is actually how it would be. And they don't take into consideration the fact that, just empirically as a rational human being, that how likely is it that your beliefs are going to be correct? They don't take into consideration the fact that there's a lot of evidence against your own beliefs because other people see differently. So this idea of not believing in your beliefs is actually quite central to Buddhism. This is why I say we don't look at what are your views and opinions. Really, for pure Buddhism, we're interested what is the nature of views and opinions. And the nature of views and opinions is they cloud your mind, they constrict your mind, they prevent you from absorbing new information very often. And finally, in practically every time, your beliefs are probably going to be incorrect. So you have this as a premise of Buddhism, that we're starting from a point of view of ignorance, not from a point of view of knowing. So a revealed religion to the converse, you would start off with a book or a teaching, and this is the absolute truth, now that you know the absolute truth. And then they ignore the fact that everyone disagrees on what the absolute truth is. <laughs> okay. Buddhism, you're starting from the fact that you are ignorant. You don't know if there's heaven and hell. You don't know if there's God. You don't know if there's rebirth. You don't know why you're here. You don't even know how the body and the mind work. That's our point of research then. We can start to look directly instead of trying to look through a series of concepts. Right. Whereas something like Christianity or Catholicism or one of the Western religions would, would say, this is how the universe is made, these are the rules, and that's it. Yes, but I wouldn't split it along the lines of Eastern or Western religion. I would be much more inclined to split it in terms of exoteric and esoteric religion. Uh, that is to say, there are a lot of meditation lineages in Christianity and Islam that are actually very similar to the meditation lineage of Buddhism that would also be giving up the views and opinions. For example, in Buddhism we have this teaching of non-self, but St. John of the Cross taught about this four or five hundred years ago. And he said the self was like the dirt on a pane of glass. If you clean the pane of glass, God can act through you uninterrupted. But if there's dirt on the glass, then, then the whole pattern and the flow is, in, is interrupted. I think it's very arrogant of, of anyone to assume they know anything about what happens eventually to us all. So I just sort of take a sit back, wait until I die approach, and I'll figure it out then. Because I think there's, there's no point in wasting time and energy and brain power trying to imagine what will happen because there's no way we can know. Hmm. Uh, so there's, there's the esoteric and the exoteric religions, and all the religions do actually have these kind of meditation lineages where they go inwards. The exoteric religions tend to be more uh, the common people based around the beliefs, the views, and opinions. You should ride a bicycle and you should not ride a bicycle. You can buy something in Pantip but you can't smoke a cigarette. You can have cheese in the evening but not coffee. I mean, all kinds of strange and interesting ideas. Now, talking about these cultural norms and their cultural conditions, uh, our friend Tony here is off to Japan and you're going to get hit with probably the world's wackiest set of cultural conditions when you get there. Yeah. Uh, Japanese, to my... To put it mildly. What I've seen of them really have a, I don't know, a strong culture, but certainly a very wacky kind of culture. You could call it You're a prepared. uniform culture. Uniform culture. Another one would be hive mentality. Mm -hmm. The Japanese believe in harmony. Mm. And so their whole culture, you know, revolves around keeping the harmony in culture, not disturbing anything. So their whole mantra, so to speak, is just to keep the peace, be part of the group, don't stand out. Now your mother was Japanese, right? Yes. Um, but how much of Japanese culture have you been exposed to before? Almost none. Okay, so you're going to have fun when you get there. <laughs> it's going to be an interesting <laughs> experience. Interesting. Put it this way, like Japanese culture is probably about as far from Thai culture as you can get. There is no Maip and Lai in that country. There are procedures, paperwork, and certificates. <laughs> I think it's as far from any other culture in there. It is, it is. I mean, I've traveled around the world quite a bit, and it, what fascinates me about Japan is there's not a lot of other cultures like it. Mm. Mm. They're yeah. like a little, and they're, they're an island nation, they're island mentality. So it's a very interesting place to live. And you're going to be doing a Tokyo podcast? I'll be uh, launching Tokyo podcast when I get there. And people can uh, like the Tokyo podcast on Facebook? They already. can, yeah. You should have a Shinto monk on Tokyo podcast. 
I will try to get uh, yeah Shinto Monk on, and maybe we'll do a Skype call with Prop Pandit, and you guys can go at it. <laughs> you can fly me over there. <laughs> yeah, sure, no problem. Yeah, get right on that. <laughs> I'll get right on that. <laughs> that belief might change. <laughs> Okay, yeah. thank you very much to my two guests, uh, Tony Joe and you. Greg Jordanson. Thank you.